If you're ready for the word of God this morning, say, let's go. Let's read together. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we are we all humble in many ways. In many things, if anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the the pilot desires." Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who've been made in the similitude of God. Out of the mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no, spring yields both salt, water, and fresh. If you like my notes this morning, you can text notes to the numbers on the screen. What's in front of me will be in front of you. Let's pray and let's ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning through his word today. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your word. It is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. And Lord, I ask today, God, as we open your word, that God, you would make it alive in our hearts. Lord, it wouldn't just be words on a page, God, but Lord, it would penetrate the places within us, God, so that, Lord, we might not just be hearers, as we have talked about already in James, God, but Lord, we would be doers of the word. Lord, I believe today, God, that as we look at your word, Jesus, that, Lord, there's been Words spoken over people in this room. Words that have held them back from their calling and their purpose. And God, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit, God, that Lord, today they would find freedom, Jesus. Lord, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And so, God, we ask for you to move and you to work in every life and in every heart, in my own heart, oh God. Lord, I come humbly before you today asking, Lord Jesus, for you to fill me up to overflow, God. Lord, that my words would be few. And God, Lord, we would receive from you this morning and not myself. God, we thank you. We love you. We bless you. And everyone said in this room this morning, amen, amen, amen. Uh, You know, good coaches, they know the right way words to say to their players in order to get out of each player individually their best, right? They know how to, how to, how to speak to each player individually, how to talk to them so they're able to perform, they're able to do, to do well uh, in the game that they are playing. Some players will receive uh, one word uh, differently than another, and so they'll learn how to talk to each player individually. You know, for, for my son, before he plays basketball, I've talked a little bit about that here on, on Sundays. Before he plays basketball, though, I'll encourage him. I'll say this. Caleb, man, you look good. You feel good. You are good. Now go have fun. You look good. You feel good. You are good. Now go have fun. And I do this a little bit tongue-in-cheek. I do this because I want him to get out of his head any mental stuff that might be there. I want him to forget about, uh, about other people and just play his game. I want him to be mindful of his teammates, but just to play his game and not worry about what's going on and just have fun with it, right? Because you got to be loose, right, when you're playing sports and have this confidence. And so I'll encourage him with that. And we do this whole huddle thing. I'll give him a pep talk before the game. 
whole nine yards. But how many of you know that words are powerful? What we say to individuals is powerful. We can use our words to encourage someone or we can use our words to discourage someone. When you look at scripture at the very beginning, what does it say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God spoke the universe into existence. God spoke this planet into existence. God said, let there be light, and what happened? There was light. Words are incredibly powerful. God's words are incredibly powerful. Some of you in this room right now, you're walking in the ministry and walking in the plan that God has for you in your life because someone saw a gifting inside of you. Someone saw potential inside of you. Someone said, man, they've got something on them and they called out destiny within you and you took it and you began to walk in it. Some of you in this room, you received a prophetic word from someone. And you said, man, I grab a hold of that. I'm going to walk it out. How many of you know that somebody can give you a prophetic word, but it also takes action on your part to walk it out as well? It takes action steps. And also with prophetic, we've said this around here, that if someone gives you a prophetic word, you can either receive that word or you can reject it. You can say, that's not for me. That's not what I want. Right? Or you can say, man, I received that word. I'm going to walk in that and walk in my destiny. While many of you also in this room, you're not walking in the calling and the potential that God has for you because someone spoke death over you. Someone spoke words to you and it hurt. Someone spoke words to you and it tore you down. Someone said to you something around you, about you, that you heard about, gossiped about you, and now you're walking defeated. There's an old saying from a, the previous generation, so to speak, and many of you who are older know this, but as they said, sticks and stones might break my bones, but words may what? Never hurt me. It's not really true, is it? That comes from a generation that has a thicker backbone, and has, carries a little bit more oomph with them, and the generation nowadays, it might feel like, man, they're a little bit on the weak side, but man, that statement still is not true. What is true is the proverb, death and life is in the power of the tongue. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. Our words are powerful. What we say, what we speak, what we speak over one another, what we say to our family, what we say to our kids, it can change their perspective and their heart and the way they think about themselves, and it is powerful. I really have three goals this morning. I've also got three points, and I've got three things to apply to your life. Uh, let me tell you, first off, the goal for this morning, the three goals, is this, that any words that have been spoken over you today that are not from God, that tore you down, that held you back from walking in your potential and walking in your calling, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would be liberated and walk in freedom today. The other goal is that anything that you have spoken over someone else, maybe a loved one or, uh, or a, a kid uh, in your life that was a mistake, that that would be broken by the power of the Holy Spirit today. And that any word that you have received that has been spoken over, you would be able to extend forgiveness towards that person. How many of you know that today that, man, many of you in this room, man, you have been spoke about, spoken to from someone else, and it has hurt inside of you, and if you're really honest with yourself, it's kind of holding you back just a little bit. My prayer for you, and has been all week, is that you would begin to walk in your potential and that every word that has been spoken over you would be broken by the power of the Holy Spirit today. The first thing I want to give you that we can look at when we're looking at James chapter 3 is this. The tongue must answer for its actions. The tongue must answer for its actions. James starts off with a warning here in verse 1. What does he say? He says, uh, you shouldn't do it which is a little bit foreign to us in a culture today where we're always told you should do it. And James is saying you shouldn't do it. What is he talking about? Shouldn't be a teacher 
My brethren, or you should count the cost with it. Look at this, beginning of uh, the first verse. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, which might seem a little discouraging because being a teacher, it feels like, man, that's a really honorable, good thing to go after, that you would be a teacher, teach the word of God. But why is he saying this? He answers the question in the second part. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers knowing that what? We shall receive a stricter judgment. Teachers of the word of God will receive a stricter judgment. In Ephesians 4, Paul lists out the fivefold ministry. One of the fivefold ministry, part of that is a teacher. So you have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, a, all five of those are uh, given to the church as a gift for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. That's the purpose of the fivefold ministry, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Let me give you a biblical definition of a teacher, though. It's an individual within the church gifted with the ability to understand, explain, and apply the Bible for the purpose of equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. So what is likely here in James 1 is this. is James is addressing those within the church who are pursuing the position of the teacher, not because they want to equip the saints, though, but because they want the honor associated with being a teacher. The teacher really replaced the, the Jewish rabbi. The Jewish rabbi, he was, uh, he was honored, he was held in high esteem. The Jewish rabbi was put on a pedestal, so to speak. And when someone is put on a pedestal like that, it is dangerous for the human heart if left unchecked. And so James is warning, saying, man, you don't want this job. You don't want this dangerous occupation because you are going to be judged more strictly. So beware, be careful. Nowadays, isn't it so much easier for people to just become a teacher? I mean, think about it. 20 years ago, it wasn't nearly as easy. You can go on social media now a days and post videos and teaching the word of God and uh, it just... Be, be off altogether. You see it time and time again. People nowadays, they have self-ordained themselves, self-ordained themselves to become a teacher of the word of God. And what I'm just saying with all this is that when we get to heaven, people may not understand it, but they're going to be judged more strictly and they don't even understand that, man, because I started teaching the word, they're going to be judged in a way that they may not even expect. That many of you in this room, you got to be careful with it. Here's the thing with being a teacher of the word of God or even a pastor or in ministry. As James is warning here, it's not something that you should desire because of the honor associated with it. It's something that is a calling upon your life. It's something that God calls you to. And for me, in my own personal story, I remember when the Lord started calling me and I felt like this quickening in my spirit to become a lead pastor, and immediately when I felt like the Lord would begin to do that, and people and, and begin, begin to receive prophetic words from people over this, I first was thinking, Lord, I don't want to do that. There is no way. This is like six years ago. There's no way I want to do that because I know that along with it becomes this weight, becomes a responsibility, becomes uh, this, uh, this uh, reverence that you have to have with walking in a position like this as a pastor or a teacher. And there's nothing I ever really, really wanted, but it was a calling God gave me. And I said to the Lord, okay, Lord, if you're calling me to do this, I will do it out of my love for you. And so when you're feeling this calling inside of your own heart, what you immediately begin to do is you have to begin to prepare yourself for that, Right? When I felt the calling, I began to prepare myself for long before I stepped into this role as a pastor, long before I began to teach the word of God in the way that I do. I felt the call. I began to prepare myself, prepare my heart, and there's a weight that comes along with that. Many of us in this room, we got to feel the weight of that call. The Lord is calling you into that as the biggest blessing that you could possibly ever walk into, but along with it, there has to be this reverence, there has to be this weight, there has to be this place of, Lord, you've got to help me through this. 
But it can't be out of your own might, out of your own ability, or because you want the place of honor. It has to be, Lord, I feel the call, and I'm going to do it because I love you, and I want to be obedient to you. And here's the thing about this, as we are called into being a teacher or in a position of leadership, we can be called but not yet sent. And so you've got to allow the Lord, Lord, do a work inside of me while you're calling me and not push yourself forward into that position before you walk into it prematurely because if your character is not in line with the gifting and the calling upon your life as the Lord works on that, man, it's going to be really, really difficult and really, really hard for the people that you lead. Because you always got to recognize, man, Lord, to help my character, may it be in line with what you're calling me to do. Amen? Amen. So the first thing this morning is this, that the tongue must answer for its actions because the tongue is powerful, which leads me to point number two this morning is the tongue wields great power. How many know that? The tongue wields great power. Verses three through eight, James uses illustrations to paint this picture of the tongue and its controlling influence, starting in verse three. It says, indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. James points out here three small things that control large objects. A horse's bit, a ship's rudder, and a forest fire. You know, I, I don't really know too much about riding horses. The last time I rode a horse uh, was on my honeymoon 18 years ago. You know, I don't, it's not really something that we're familiar with. And the only thing I was thinking about was, man, I'm in paradise with my bride, my new bride. I wasn't really thinking about how is this horse working and why is it going this way when I pull it. You know, I, we don't really understand horses nowadays. Some of you do because you got one some and it's a hobby of yours. But uh, upon studying this, I found out that the bit in the horse's mouth is put in the most sensitive area inside of the horse. And so any direction that you're pulling the reins, so to speak, it will go because it's the most comfortable thing. If it doesn't listen to the way you're steering the horse, then it's, it's, uh, it's going to be painful for the horse. And so it's incredible that this small little thing inside of a horse's mouth that is much bigger than us, we can tame it and it will go and do what we ask it to do. But it's the great irony that this small tongue inside of our mouths we can't control. That's what James is talking about. We can't control this tongue inside of our mouths. We can't control it. How many know who can control it? It's the Holy Spirit living inside of us that will allow us to, to control our tongues and allow us to control our mouths. Look at verse uh, 7 now. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is unruly evil full of deadly poison. James is taking us back to Genesis chapter 1 when God created every beast, bird, reptile, flying creature, God made man and woman in his own image, and he gave us dominion over every animal. A function of this dominion is taming the wild things, taming animals. How? Using a leash, a bit, a gate, or a command. Animals that are much bigger, much stronger, much faster than us, mankind has been able to tame because God has given us dominion over it. But this little tongue James is saying inside of all of our mouths, no human being can tame it. It's why in James 
verse, uh, uh, James 3 here in verse 8, he calls it an unruly evil full of deadly poison. It's like a two-year-old right before bed. You just can't control it, right? You can't control this thing inside of our mouths, this tongue that just kind of does whatever it wants to do if left unchecked. It's what causes us to pick up our phone and make a post on social media that's divisive or make a comment about something that we don't really understand and don't have the context of it. It's what causes us to speak harsh words towards friends or behind their backs. It's what causes us to tear down even our kids when they don't deserve it. This thing inside our mouths is something that we can't control. James is saying, by our own might, by our own ability, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can. James is calling it unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Full of deadly poison. In verse 6, he calls it that it's set on fire by hell. Meaning that there are moments and times, how many of you know this? There are moments and times in our lives where we can say things and we're doing Satan's bidding. It's not coming from a place of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. It's coming from a place that is full of the flesh and not of the spirit, that we say things that are really from the pit of hell, set on fire by hell. It's when Peter says to Jesus, even though he's a good disciple, he's thinking he's doing a good thing, that Jesus wouldn't go and to die on the cross. But Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. Our words are powerful and what we speak and what we say And so, in other words, if what I'm saying contradicts what brings honor to God, then the origin of my words is from the enemy. If what I'm saying, if what I'm speaking contradicts God, then the origin of my words is from the enemy. So point number three this morning here in James is the tongue lacks consistency. The tongue lacks consistency. Verse 9. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. With this tongue, we bless God, and with the same tongue, and sometimes even with the same breath, we will curse men. May what we say and what we speak Line up with our worship on a Sunday morning. May we be the same people here as we are outside of the church. May what we speak and what we say line up and give glory to God and God alone. Because our issue is not controlling this tongue because no man, no person can control it. But it's more with dealing with our hearts. It's why Luke writes and says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What is inside of your heart is going to come out verbally with your mouth. Our words reveal what is in our hearts. Look at verse 10. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. James here is giving the example of a spring that has fresh and salt water or fig tree that grows olives or grapevine that produces fruit. What James is getting at and what James wants us to see is that a plant's fruit is supposed to correspond with the plant. It isn't enough to try to tame our tongue by simply refusing to talk. Because, I mean, we're not going to just stop talking Right? We have to deal with the source of what's coming out of our mouth, which is our heart. Why? So that our worship, it matches our words. So what James shows us is that if you want to know how your heart really is, pay attention to the words that are coming out of your mouth. If you want to know what's really going on inside of your heart, what really is the heartbeat of who you are Listen to your words. Like really listen to your words. 
So this is what I want to do now. I want to give you three things that you can apply to your life to allow your heart to be in line with your worship, that your words would be in line with your worship. The first thing is this, be honest with yourself. Right, we've got to be honest with ourselves. What does this mean to be honest is to confess, to repent for the ways we have used words to tear down instead of build up. We need to repent for whatever we've said to others. You know, repentance is this, when Jesus said repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repentance is to change the way you think. The way you change the way you think is to change your heart posture before the Lord. To change the way you think for the kingdom of God is at hand. We've got to be able to repent, be honest with ourselves. Where have we spoken things that have tore others down? Maybe today we need to repent even inwardly about the things we've spoken about ourselves. Give ourselves grace. We've spoken death over our own selves. And it's caused us to be held back from what God has for us. We've listened to the enemy instead of listening to the spirit of God living within us. May we repent of that, of the things we've spoken of ourselves. We've got to come to a place to where we repent. In Proverbs it says this though, because although we can use our words to hurt, we can also use our words to heal. It says this in Proverbs 12, 18, there is one whose rash words are like sword thrust, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Know this, your words, they have power to heal. Your words have power to heal. And so here's my encouragement to every single one of us in this room. Use your words to heal. Use your words to bring healing. Use your words to uh, extend uh, forgiveness. Use your words to uh, offer uh, forgiveness towards a person you may have offended. Use your words to bring healing. The second thing I want to give you to align your heart with God so our words align with our worship is fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Jesus. And of course, we know to fix our eyes on Jesus, and we say this in context oftentimes of, man, when you're going through a storm, just fix your eyes on Jesus. But what about the context of our mouth, our tongue, and the way that we speak? Because the Bible has a lot to say about how Jesus spoke and how Jesus used his words. How did Jesus speak? Let me tell you, as a young boy, Jesus was found by his parents in the temple sitting among the teachers, listening and asking them questions. The text says that all who heard him were astounded at his understanding and answers, which shows us that Jesus used wise words. When driven into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted, one of the temptations was for Jesus to use his words to command the stones to become bread. The issue was that Jesus was being tempted to utilize his divine power to serve himself. But Jesus responded to each of Satan's temptation with scriptures. Jesus used God's words. When a man possessed by a demon came out of a synagogue, Jesus spoke directly to the demon and commanded it to come out, and the spirit obeyed him. The onlooker saw to one another and said, what is this word? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. Jesus used words that brought freedom. One day while Jesus was asleep on a boat, the wind and the waves began to, bring, to break against it, filling the boat with water, while the disciples used their words to accuse Jesus of lacking compassion. Jesus spoke directly to the sea, saying, peace, be still, calming the winds and the waves that shows us that you, Jesus used authoritative words. When a rich young ruler came to Jesus asking how he could inherit eternal life, the Bible says that Jesus looked at the young man, loved him, and said to him, you lack one thing. 
Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. The rich young ruler walked away sad because he loved his money more than his maker. But Jesus still spoke hard words. That night when Jesus was in the garden, kneeling on the ground with sweat and blood dripping from his face, he knew that soon he would carry a cross and absorb the God's wrath This wrath didn't belong to him. It was God's response to our sins. Not just the sins of our bodies, but the sins of our tongues. Every harsh, every hateful, every oppressive word, every unkind word, lustful, manipulative, covetous, jealous, arrogant, self-righteous, and people-pleasing word we have or ever will demand the holy judgment of God. Jesus knew that he came from heaven to earth for this moment. And in that moment, he used his words to speak to the Father, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus spoke obedient words. When on the cross after our sins and our judgment were placed on the innocent lamb of God, Jesus spoke the words that saved each of our lives. It is finished. Jesus used redeeming words. You see, we Fix our eyes on Jesus because in Jesus we see what it looks like to have words that are honoring to God and using our words that are powerful and wise. May we fix our eyes on Jesus so that the things that come out of our mouth will be pleasing to Jesus. Because when we fix our eyes on Jesus, what happens is it changes our heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. May we use our words. May we use our words to be wise. May we use our words to build each other up. May we use our words to encourage one another. May we use our words to call out destiny in others in our lives. To see uh, the promises of the Lord being fulfilled in each other's lives because of the words that we speak to one another. The last thing that I want you to apply to your life. Number one, be honest with yourself. Number two, fix your eyes on Jesus. And number three, Continually fill yourself with the Holy Spirit until there's overflow. Continually fill yourself with the Holy Spirit until there's overflow. Ephesians 5.18 says this, and don't get drunk with wine, which is rebellion. Instead, be filled continually with the Holy Spirit. Be filled continually with the Holy Spirit. Yes, at salvation you are filled with the Holy Spirit, but may that overflow into your soul in your body. We're made up of three parts, our spirit, soul, and body. The Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of our spirit man, but what needs to be redeemed on a daily basis is our mind, our will, and our emotions, and our bodies. That it would be an overflow from our spirit over into the things that we speak, the words that we say, and our minds, our actions, and who we are. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit is our helper that Jesus promised. And he fell upon those people in the upper room. And they were set ablaze with tongues of fire, speaking words of other nations. And they heard these words and were drawn to Christ. And from that place, 3,000 people came to the faith through a message that Peter spoke. But it was done because the Holy Spirit redeemed their words. What we need in this time that we live in is the Holy Spirit to fill us up to rivers of living water that what comes out of our mouth would be pleasing and honoring to God. We can't do it on our own, right? What's the only way that we can do it? It's the Holy Spirit living inside of us. James talks about there's no man that can tame this small tongue but I'm here to tell you the Holy Spirit can with his help he can but as I talked about the beginning uh, my main goal here today is this I believe there's many people in this room today where they have heard 
words that have torn them down, that have kept them back from walking in their purpose and their calling. And it has destroyed really their ability to be confident in who God has made them to be. My prayer today is this, that you would begin to walk in freedom from those words that have been spoken over you. That yes, death is in the power of the tongue, but so is life in the power of the tongue. That you would walk in the power and the spirit of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. That you would no longer walk timidly, that you would no longer walk in shame, that you would no longer walk bound, that you would no longer walk in fear, that you would no longer walk in the way that the enemy wants you to walk in, but you would be bold and you would be able to stand for what God has called you to do for such a time as this. Because we can't Listen, we, we can't have a church that's timid, walking in fear, full of shame, and not walking in their calling. And what I'm here today to say is every curse, everything that's been spoken over you is broken in the name of Jesus. The name above every name, the name that has bring liberty and life and the spirit of God within you. Would you do me a favor, would you rise with me all over this room?